Thanks, Noam, and thanks for the organizers for inviting me to speak. Um, okay, so I'll talk about shortest paths in weighted directed graphs, and luckily for me, this, prog this problem does not need any introduction. We all learn about it as undergraduates. We have a graph. The edges have weights. We can think of our graph as being represented by a matrix. Uh, in row I and column J, we put the weight of the edge from I to J. Could be a it could be could be a directed graph. Do you hear me? Okay. It could be a directed graph, so the metric need not be symmetric. And we put infinity if there is no edge from a, if there is no edge from I to J. And what we want is for certain pairs of the vertices to compute the shortest path connecting them. In particular, I would like to compute the distance between certain pairs of vertices. So the first case that we look at is we might like to do it for all pairs of vertices. So our output is also a matrix, where in row i and column j, we'd like to have the distance from i to j. The distance is just the sum of the weights on a shortest path. Usually, we don't only want the distances. We also want some data structure that will help, help us reconstruct the path themselves. But in this talk, I will uh, mainly be concern, concerned with distances. So if we want to do it for all the pairs of vertices, uh, this is what we call the all, all, all pairs shortest path problem. But we might be interested in doing it for some particular subset of pairs, perhaps, say, from some specific vertex to all other vertices, say, in this example, from vertex 1 to all other vertices. So this is just a row in this matrix, a single source shortest path. We might be looking for a particular distance, say, the largest distance. This is what we call the diameter of the graph. In this example, the diameter would be 8, and it would be realized by a shortest path from vertex 5 to vertex 1. More generally, we might be interested in looking at a subset of uh, pairs that do not cross some threshold. So I give you some threshold. Suppose I give you the threshold 0, and I want to report all pairs of vertices whose distance does not exceed 0. So this, in this graph, these would be the pairs. So here is the simple hierarchy of these outputs. If you have an algorithm for all pairs, then of course, you can use it as a trivial byproduct pro product for all other uh, cases. But maybe you can do better if you're looking for a particular subset. Uh, let me just mention that if you have an algorithm for threshold, then you can use it almost directly by having some logarithmic reduction to also, also compute the diameter. What you just need to do is do some binary searching on the threshold, and then you can locate the precise diameter. So similarly for the girth. The girth of a graph is just the weight of a shortest cycle on the graph. So threshold all per shortest path up to a polylogarithmic reduction is a <coughs> gives you also an algorithm for diameter and for the girth. But we don't only uh, look at variances with re respect to the output. We are only con also concerned about the inputs. Maybe the type of input graph affects our algorithm. If our graph is undirected, the problem might be easier because directed graphs are more general than undirected graphs. Likewise, if we know that our graph belongs to some family of graphs, suppose the graph is planar, maybe you can use planarity to exploit it and obtain faster algorithm for uh, finding distances. And also the weights themselves. If the graph is unweighted, this could be easier than just a general case of weights. Maybe the weights are only positive or maybe I allow also negative edge weights. The weights could be bounded or unbounded. All of these things, all of the combinations of these variants could affect our design of the algorithm. So what I want to do in the next slide is uh, recall the known classics in this area, the ones that we all learn of as undergraduates. Perhaps the simplest one is breadth first search. Breadth first search is just a single source algorithm in an unweighted graph. And we all know that breadth first search runs in linear time, n being the number of vertices and m being the number of edges. If you have weights, not say non-negative edge weights, you can no longer use breadth first search. You have to replace your q with a priority q, and there is a cost for doing that. This is Dijkstra's algorithm, and the running time Dijkstra's algorithm is almost linear. It's m plus n log n because of the use of the heap. Uh, once you have negative edge weights, the situation becomes significantly more uh, costly. 
And the classical algorithm there is the Bellman-Ford algorithm, which solves the single source in the most general setting, positive and negative edge weights with, with no restriction, in times which is a product of the number of vertices and the number of edges. So you see that if your graph is dense, the running time would be cubic. What about all pairs? The classical algorithm there, which doesn't assume anything about the graph, works in any case, is the floyd warshall algorithm. It is a cubic algorithm. Uh, now Johnson observed the following trick. If you have negative edge weights, you can do just one iteration of single source and reweigh the edges so that after you reweigh them, you maintain your shortest path. Once the edges are reweighed, they are all non-negative, and you can apply Dijkstra's algorithm from, from every vertex separately. And the running time you obtain there would be nm plus n square log n. And notice that this is preferable to Floyd Warshall whenever your graph is uh, not very dense. It's less than n square. The number of edges is less than n square. We can also view transitive closure as a, as a case of a, on a shortest path problem. Transitive closure is just an all pairs shortest path in graphs with zero weights, right? We only care about reachability. You can also view transitive closure as threshold all pairs shortest path in a graph with weights one, where your threshold is n. Because if you can reach from u to v, you can necessarily do it in at most n steps, right? You don't go through cycles. So this can also be viewed as a threshold algorithm. Now, the nice thing about transitive closure is that I actually only care about the existence or non-existence of edge. So I can look at the adjacency matrix of the graph as a Boolean matrix, zero if there is no edge, one if there is an edge. And we know that if we look at this as a Boolean matrix and raise it using Boolean matrix multiplication to a power of n, then what we'll get is another Boolean matrix, with I which is the transitive closure of the graph. So up to log you can do it, of course, in a logarithmic number of steps. So the problem of transitive closure reduces to the problem of multiplying two, ba two Boolean matrices. And luckily, we know how to multiply Boolean matrices faster than cubic time. Currently, we know how to do it in time which is n to the power of 2.38. So transitive closure can be solved in this time. Finally, another and well-known classic is Seidel's algorithm. Seidel solves the all pairs shortest path problem in undirected, unweighted graphs, also in matrix multiplication time. But Seidel's algorithm does not only work, does not only need Boolean matrix multiplication, it also needs integer matrix multiplication. But still we can do it in this time. It's slightly more complicated than the transitive closure, but uh, also uh, the rather easy algorithm to explain. And what I want to do in the next slide is view some more recent records that improve upon these known classics in various combinations that I mentioned before with respect to the type of weights and the types of graph, etc. I'll first want to mention two uh, minor improvements, but what I think of major results. They, ma they are minor in the sense these first two, they are only logarithmic improvements upon the known classics, but they are currently the best that we know in these settings. So the first result is an algorithm of Timothy Chan. And notice that his algorithm is the most general case. All pairs, no restrictions. Well, what's the big deal? N cube, Floyd Warshall also already does that, divided by log square. You know, not something that you would want to code, right? N cube divided by log square. But the point is, this is the world record. This is the best that we know for all pairs in the most general setting. And actually, Chan's result is uh, currently the end of the line in a long sequence of logarithmic improvements to, to a Floyd Warshall, dating back to a result of Fredman from the 70s. And actually, all of the sequence of these algorithms use ideas of Fredman. But this is the world record for the most general case. Another very nice result is an, al an algorithm of Michael Thorup, roughly ten from roughly 10 years ago. Remember that Dijkstra has a prior priority queue. We have to pay some logarithmic price, so it's not truly linear if your graph is sparse. What Michael manages to do is make it truly linear, but under some assumption. First of all, it only works in undirected graphs, and you need to assume that your weights are integers. 
Well, assuming that the weights are integer is a rather natural assumption if you believe that we are actually going to put our weights inside computer worlds. But the undirected restriction is still a restriction that we don't know how to get rid of. And now, from here on, I want to talk about a major improvement in the sense that they are polynomial improvements over classical results, not only logarithmic improvements. Uh, and I, I will now assume for the rest, rest of the this talk that my weights are integers. They are integers between, say, minus capital M to plus capital M. So the first result I'd like to mention is an algorithm of Goldberg. And remember, we have this uh, single source which in general you have Bellman Ford, which is NM, which is cubic. What Goldberg manages to do is solve single source, and the only assumption is now that the weights are integers, and the running time he gets is much better than cubic. It's m square root n, so you see that even in dense graphs, this is only n to the 2.5, times a logarithmic factor <coughs> that depends on the largest absolute value of a weight. Uh, what about all pairs? Well, remember uh, Seidel's algorithm. Seidel is in matrix multiplication time, but only in undirected, unweighted. Once you have weights, Seidel's algorithm does not carry over. You need to do something which is more tricky. This is not so easy to get to, to generalize Seidel's algorithm once you have weights. And what Shoshan and Uri Zwick managed to do was solve, was actually to general, generalize Seidel's algorithm, and they solved the all pair shortest path problem in undirected graph, but now they allow weights from 0 to m in matrix multiplication time. If m is not a constant, then the price that you pay is a factor on the absolute value of the weight. By the way, they assume that the weights are non negative, not because they are lazy, but because they are, there is no point in talking about negative weight edges in an undirected graph because you don't want negative edge cycles. E, what's, the, what's the world record in integer edge weights when a, your graph is directed? Well, the record here is a result of Uri from a, roughly slightly more than ten, 10 years ago. He solves the all pairs shortest path problem in the most general setting of integer edge weights in time which is what should we compare it to? We should compare it to, Flo to Floyd Warshall, right? Floyd Warshall is cubic, and Uri pro solves it in time which is uh, slightly strange. This is not a typo. It's not 2.38, it's 2.58, but it, it relates to 2.38. As we'll see in this talk, many times the exponents themselves are functions of matrix multiplication exponent. So this 2.58 is a function of 2.38. Slightly more than five years ago, uh, together with Uri, we designed an algorithm for single source shortest path, again in the general case of integer edge weights, which runs in matrix multiplication time. What should this be compared to? This should be compared to Goldberg's algorithm. What happens if your graph is dense in Goldberg's algorithm? The running time would be n to the 2.5. Here you get it better. It's only matrix multiplication time. And if you're optimistic about the future, and you think that eventually we'll be able to solve, to multiply two matrices in quadratic time, then this would become an optimal algorithm, at least when, the, when your graph is dense. You will not be able to do better. And recently, a result of mine on threshold all pair shortest path, remember, threshold generalizes gears and diameter in the most general setting of integer wage edge weights. In time, well, Again, this is not a typo. What's the big deal? 2.58 here, 2.56 here. Well, the big deal here is that it's not all pairs. In order to solve, say, diameter in a graph with positive and negative edge weights, you don't need the heavy tool of all pairs. If you do all pairs, then, of course, you have diameter. You can actually avoid it. You get a smaller exponent. Let me just mention that all of these three results are interesting already in the case where m is 1. Your weights are just minus 1, 0, and 1. Already in this case, these are uh, the best results that are known. Let's see what happens if we are optimistic about matrix multiplication exponents. If eventually you can multiply two matrices in n squared time, this, the exponents in this algorithm would become very nice. 
fixed algorithm would have an exponent of 2.5. The used of fixed algorithm for single source would have an exponent of n square, which, as I said, would be optimal for dense graphs. And this, late la this result on threshold would have an exponent of 7 over 3, 2 and 1 third. Okay, so we've see, we see here that whenever we have integer edge weights, somehow matrix multiplication starts to play a role in these algorithms. And what I want to do in the next few minutes is explain why this is the case. So let's first remember a, a general algebraic matrix multiplication. Just to, pull, to find one entry in the product, we do an inner product of row i and column j. And if we do it naively for all entries in the product, we, this will take us a cubic number of multiplications, in particular a cubic number of arithmetic operations. It was quite surprising at the time, over 40 years ago, where, when Strassen actually showed that you can use less number of uh, arithmetic operations. And his idea was very simple. You start with two by two matrices and just multiply them using seven products instead of eight. And now do it recursively but remember, if you do it recursively, you now use the fact that matrices themselves form a ring. Okay. So if you do it recursively, the exponent becomes log to the base 2 of 7 instead of log to the base 2 of 8. Over the years, there were improvements to this exponent. Uh, ending up uh, currently, in the fastest result is by Coppersmith and, and Winograd, and they achieve an exponent of this exponent of 2.38. Let me just mention another application of group theory uh, related to this problem. In recent years, there was another approach which is promising because it's slightly simpler to describe than corpus with Winograd through group theory that actually achieves the same exponent. And actually, if you can find better group representations, then you would be able to uh, improve upon this exponent, but this is still not known. E so let us denote by omega the true matrix of multiplication exponent that God knows. God knows omega. We know at least that omega is less than 2.38. And it, of course, will be at least 2, right? You have to write the output eventually. So let us denote it generally by omega. E, but remember, we want to solve shortest path problems. We don't need this just a algebraic product. So we need another kind of product on matrices. So here is how we define it. We call it distance products. And it's, it's only a product of matrices. Forget about graphs. You have two matrices, A and B. The entries are reals. What? what? <laughs> uh, I didn't check the fonts. I didn't check the fonts. This should be a union infinity. The entries are reals, and some of the entries are allowed to be infinity. And I didn't do it on purpose, sorry. Uh, so here is our, how we define the distance product of uh, two matrices with real entries, some of them being infinity. We denote by Cij, entry, C, entry ij in the product will be just the minimum over all k of aik plus bkj. In other words, we replaced multiplication with addition and we replaced summation with taking minimum. So here's an example. The two matrices here on the right are being distance product to achieve the matrix on the left. Why is there a minus 6 here? Because minus 3 plus minus 3 is less than 1 plus 8, and it is less, less than 7 plus 5. OK, so this is a simple definition. But why is it good for shortest path problem? So remember that we think of our input graph as being represented by a matrix. So suppose our graph is the matrix W. So the entries are reals, and some of them are infinity, right? There are no edges between some vertices. And now take this matrix of the graph and raise it to the power of n minus 1. What do I mean by raise it? Raise it using distance product. So I'm assuming this, pro this, this product is associative. It's well defined to, to raise it to the power of n minus 1. And the claim is that if you raise it using distance product to the power of n minus 1, then you will get the all pairs shortest path distance matrix. And actually, that's pretty easy to prove. You do it by induction. You prove that after you raised it to the power of k, this will give you the distances that are realized by paths that use at most k edges. And since any path uses at most n minus 1 edges, right? you never go in circles, 
then raising to the power of n minus 1 will give you the result. So you would say, uh, okay, so here's again the graph from the first slide in this talk. The matrix was w. We raise it to the power of 4. Why 4? Because the, four, the graph has five vertices, and this will be the all pairs shortest matrix of the graph. Yeah, okay, but uh, now we want to do distance products fast, not algebraic products fast. So how to do it? And there's a problem. All of these algorithms of Strassen and Coppersfeind-Vinograd and the group uh, theoretic approach, they rely on the fact that we work inside algebraic rings. For example, they use subtractions. Now, this mean plus is not an algebraic ring. You cannot use these algorithms to do distance products. So we want to circumvent the, prob the, the fact that these are, this is not an alg algebraic ring. So let's see a trick, how to, a simple trick, how to circumvent this problem, but it will be a costly trick. So here's the trick. Think to take your two matrices A and B and now replace entry Aij with the monomial x to the power of Aij and do the same on the matrix B. Replace bij with the monomial x to the power of bij. Think of the bij's are integers now, or even positive integers, if you like. You can always shift the, the entries, doesn't matter. And now, these matrices could be considered as matrix, matrices over the ring of polynomials with the variable x. And now do, this is a ring, this is an algebraic ring. Now do a matrix multiplication inside this ring. So inside this, this ring, what would be entry ij in the product? the standard product in this ring, this will just be the polynomial sum over all, all, all k of x to the power of aik plus bkj. So in particular, if I look at this polynomial and take the term with the smallest power, this will give me cij, the minimum of aik plus bkj. So these polynomials encode the distance matrix. Okay, so good. So now we can do fast matrix multiplication in this ring. But we cannot now say that every arithmetic operation costs us unit time. We, we switch to, to, uh, to, to, we have now a variable x. We want to, to see how much it costs us. And actually, we know how much it costs us. It follows from an ob observation, actually not directly, but from some of the observation of Yuval, that this is the cost. Again, points are, this should be uh, less than, and this should be greater, uh, also less than. If the entries inside your matrices are between minus m and m, integers, integers between minus m and m, and actually that don't have to be between minus n and m. They are in some interval of integers of size, say, theta m. Then the cost of doing this approach of working over the ring of polynomials, it won't now cost you n to the omega. You'll have to pay a price the size of this interval in which the weight, weights rely on. And the, the trick is just to replace x by some large value, say n plus 1, and use the fact that you have no carry when you do this multiplication, and you can just retrace the coefficients of the polynomial. So the cost is m times n to the omega. So as in the previous talk, we can claim that I can stop here, and the other speaker will have a lot more time, because what uh, we are done, if m is constant, then we can solve it all in n to the omega time, and fine. But here is the catch. The catch is that we actually don't, are not able to do it. Remember that we want to take our matrix of the graph and raise it to the power of n minus 1. So even if I started with a graph whose, uh, whose entries, whose weights are between minus n and m, m, minus m and m, even if m is constant, minus 1, 0, and 1, once I reach the power of w to the k, the entries in W to the k are no longer between minus m and m. They are between minus m k and plus m k. And k could, k could be as large as theta n. So now to take W to the power of k and raise it by itself, which cost us n to the omega times, at least times k, and k could be theta n. So this would be n to the omega plus 1. This is very stupid, right? This is worse than cubic. So why not use Floyd Warshall and go home? Right. So this is the main problem in all, of in all this area. The main problem is that once you get to large powers, the entries get very large, and it is very costly to do this uh, trick of working over the ring. And the whole point is how to circumvent the problem of the entries getting large. So what is my plan for the remainder of this talk? What I'd like to do is to 
for now I'll be slightly more technical. I like to sketch the proof of this recent result that I mentioned on threshold all pair shortest paths. First of all, because it's a recent result, and second of all, because it uses most, almost all of the ingredients and tricks that we have in this area that circumvent the blow up in the entries of the matrix what we, when we get to large product. So these are the list of tricks that we use, and I'll try to go over them uh, separately, each one. Yeah. Okay. And for the remainder of this talk, I'll, uh, for convenience, I'll just assume that my weights are minus 1, 0, and 1. Or, but remember that it also works when the, rates, when the weights are from minus m to m, and m can, al can also depend on m. Okay? Then it also works. So in particular, I want to prove the, or sketch a proof, very rough sketch of the following result. You give me a graph, a directed graph, with bounded integer edge weights, uh, say even minus 1, 0, and 1, and you give me some threshold value d. And what we'll do is with high probability, it's a randomized algorithm, Monte Carlo, we'll report precisely, with high probability, we'll report precisely all pairs of vertices that have distance at most d. And we'll do it in time, it doesn't really matter this exponent. The point is that it's n to some exponent and the exponent is some function of matrix multiplication exponent. It is this function that is as a result of some optimizations that we do. But this is usually the phenomenon in these algorithms. You get n to some uh, power which itself is some function of this omega. Less than three. What? Less than three. Less than three. Less than three. Or at least it will... A sanity check is to put omega equal three and see that you get three. <laughs> this is a sanity check for this. Uh, let's see, for example, if we plug in what we know today, omega equals 2.38, the exponent will be 2.56. If we are optimistic, then the exponent will be 7 over 3. Uh, just a reminder, in particular, this algorithm solves to you the diameter problem in graphs with positive and negative integer edge weights and the gear problem in positive and integer uh, uh, edge weights. And of course, I put tilde because I want to say I put tilde over this O because I want to say that it solves it the same asymptotic time up to logarithmic factors. And another just reminder, why not use all pairs shortest path to solve diameter and gears? Because the exponent that uh, in the algorithm of Uri that I mentioned before, uh, the, the, the function that he gets here is larger than the function here. It, it, it will be three also. The sanity check in his results also will give you 3 if omega is 3, but if omega is, say, is 2, then the exponent he gets would be 2.5 and not 2 and 1 thirds. And even for omega x will 2.38, his exponent will be slightly larger. Okay. So I'm going to overview the, the set of tricks and tools that we have. I'll maybe not uh, have time to talk about all of them. Let's start with the easiest tool. But I'll need two definitions. The first one we usually know, let us denote by delta uv, the distance from u to v, that one that we want to find. And since we are in a weighted graph setting, moreover, we allow also negative edge weights, the fact that I know that the distance from u to v is delta doesn't tell me anything about the number of edges that I need in order to fulfill this delta. And this is an important, important parameter in these algorithms. So let me denote by CUV, the counting, the, the minimum number of edges in a path that realizes the diameter. So you see, because we allow also negative edge waves, we can have that delta UV is zero, the distance between U and V is zero, by, but in order to achieve this zero, we have to, to go over many hops. So CUV could be very large. It could be as large as theta N. Okay, and this trick, this trick that I call heating sets for long shortest path, the goal of this trick is to compute delta uv precisely, but not for all pairs, only for pairs for which cuv is large. For pairs with cuv large, this trick will compute delta uv precisely. So let me formalize this. I would like to compute for every pair of vertices some approximation, call it delta sub t uv which has the following property. Again, this is not a comma. Uh, 
this is greater, you see this is greater. <laughs> Actu this, de this delta sub t would be an actual value of a path. If it's an actual value of a path, it will always be at least as large as delta. But whenever the count on the number of edges, the CUV, whenever CUV is greater or equal to t, then this approximation would be exact. It will be exactly the, val of de the value of delta uv. And the point is that we'll be, do be able to do it fast. We'll do it in time, which is roughly n cubed divided by this threshold t, uh, plus something negligible. This would be negligible compared to this thing, uh, matrix multiplication time. OK, so here is how we do it. Suppose indeed that uh, the count cuv is greater or, e or equal to t. And consider in your mind, not in by the algorithm, for the sake of the proof, take some shortest path from u to v, p u v. We know that this path has at least, has at least it has c u v edges, so it has at least t edges. So if I have n vertices, if I randomly sample a fraction of n over t vertices, a little bit more, n times lan n over t, then with high probability, at least one vertex of my sample would hit this path, right? I have n elements, a path of length t. If I sample n over t, a bit larger, then with high probability I will uh, hit it. Hi the no, no, it's, it's, it's not inside the land. The n land is in, in the numerator and t is in the denominator. The um, okay. Uh, so this is very easy, right? But when I say with high probability, I mean that it's enough to do it with probability less than 1 over n squared. So this would apply for all pairs of vertices. And why is this good? This is good because we all know that subpaths of shortest paths are shortest paths. Namely, if I just now compute a single source from all the vertices in my sample to all the vertices in the graph, and vice versa, from all the vertices in my graph to all the vertices in my sample, I can now compute this, uh, this, this delta uv, right? Because delta uv is just the sum of delta ux plus delta xv. And since x is in my sample, I already computed delta ux and delta xv, so I just need to take the minimum over all vertices in my sample. So I reduce to the problem of computing single source for every vertex in my sample. I, I, and also in the reverse graph, right? A single destination is just like single source in the graph where you reverse, reverse the direction of the edges. But there's a catch. The graph has negative edge weights. You don't want to apply single source for every vertex in your sample separately. That would be costly because you do it in a graph with negative edge weights. So we remember Johnson's trick, right? The reweighing trick. We can just apply a single ap application of single source in a graph with negative edge weights. We can either use a Goldberg's algorithm in n to the 2.5 or the Euster trick algorithm in matrix multiplication time. We do it only once. Now we get a graph with no negative edge weights. And now we do just Dijkstra from every vertex in the sample. Now how much does Dijkstra so cost? At most it takes us ON squared time if the graph is dense. And since we do it in every, for every vertex in the sample, and the size of the sample was n over t, roughly n over t, so the overall running time would be n cube over t, plus this something which is negligible, as, as we promised. So at least it took care of all pairs for which CUV is large. The number of hops that realize the shortest path is large. And now we want to take care of those pairs with CUV is small, and this is more difficult. So now I'll need the another parameter. Not only this t that differentiates between cuv large and cuv small, but some other parameter r, which is between 1 and t. And I'll need a definition. Definition is something that we call, I call a partial distance matrix with parameters t and r. And here is the definition. It has satisfies two properties. The first property doesn't involve r. You want that for all pairs of, why is this okay now? I mean, it should have been, I mean, what? <laughs> Imagine that it always uh, switched. <laughs> okay, 
for, we want for all pairs of vertices with main, with, where the number of hops is relatively small, remember, this is what we care of. If the number of hops is large, we already took care of that. We want for all pairs of vertices where the number of hops is small, that they will have uh, some weakness. What do we mean by weakness? We want the entry, uh, weakness x, we want the entry p u x in the matrix plus the entry p x v in the matrix to be delta u v. Why, why is this good? This means that if I will do a distance product of this p with itself, then the entry u v in the product would be delta u v. Of course, I wouldn't want to do this distance product of p with itself because the entries in this p would still be large. But at least we know that this, this gives you this property. Okay, so in order to indeed to reduce the operation, we don't want to do distance product of p with itself. Here comes the second requirement that involves r. We don't only want one witness, we want many witnesses. If you give me a shortest path from uh, u to v, which realizes c u v edges, that not only will it contain a witness, it will contain a witness in every r segment, r consecutive segment of the path. Here is an example. Suppose the u and v are within, uh, have c u v equals 11, they have 11 edges on this path. Uh, if these three blue ones are witnesses, they, they have this prob property of this x here, then they do it good for r equals 4, because in every segment of four consecutive edges, there will be a representative witness. So this is the second requirement uh, in this definition of a partial distance matrices. Let me just mention that the special case of NN partial distance matrices, NN is just said that there is no second requirement, and the first requirement is just that for any pair of vertices, doesn't, doesn't matter what CUV is, you have a witness. This is, this is a, uh, the result that I mentioned of, uh, this is part of the result that I mentioned with URI in the single source algorithm. This can be done in, 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 in small time, matrix multiplication time. Uh, the more general case of It's equal. I want it to no, be no, equal. No, no, no. Yeah, 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 right, right. It's always at least, right. It, it, every entry is a result of some path computation. You're right. It's not just some random entries there. Okay, so in the more general case where instead of NN partial distance matrix, we want a TR, the algorithm is only slightly more complicated, uh, but the running time, of course, would be slightly larger depending on of on our choice of T and R. So why, why, why is it good for? Let's see, why is it good for this TR partial distance matrix? Well, we already said that the product of P with itself would give me the correct result, not in all places, but at least in places where C U V is small. And this is why I care about it. This is what we care about. But as we said, this is costly to do. And here comes the second requirement. If we know that this C U V is smaller than T, but say at least T over two, if we bound the range where C U V is, then the fact that there are many witnesses tells me that I don't have to multiply the matrix with itself. I can choose a subset of columns on the right hand side of the right hand side of P and a subset, sub subset of columns on the left of rows on the left hand side and already have a witness in this subset. So here is the picture. This is P by P. Again, you see, this, this is the distance product. Here is the choice of a subset of columns. Uh, of cardinality, something like N R over T. And the same indices on the rows. And now I'm just doing this. This is a submatrix. Take only on the, all the rows and only the subset of columns. And here, take all the columns and only the subset of rows and now compute the rectangular matrix multiplication. The dimensions are reduced, and not only they are reduced, it's even cheaper to do rectangular matrix multiplication. And because we have, we have witnesses in every R segment, then the choice of these amounts of rows and columns guarantees that there will already be a, at least one witness inside these rows and columns. So already this rectangular product would give me what I want. And of course, it's cheaper to do the rectangular product but I needed to assume that C U V is between T and T over two because I also, al also wanted really 
to bound the number of choices of my rows and columns. If it's not, if it's less than t over 2, we'll do the same for t over 2 and t over 4, and then t over 4 and t over 8. So a logarithmic number of applications of this trick would give, it, would give me everything that I want. Okay, so I, I won't have time to tell you the algorithm how to construct a partial distance matrix, not even the special case of an NN partial distance matrix. So I won't have time to tell you about this. This is a sketch of the algorithm. Where is it? Uh, what? No, if it's less than t over 2, then you, you, it, it won't suffice to take this many rows. You won't have a witness there. Okay, this, this is the reason. That you want to bound it from above and from below. Right. Uh, so I won't have time to tell you about the al this algorithm, but I would have to say just one moral. The moral is this. The moral is this. Remember that we said that the major problem in this area is that once you get to high powers, the entries inside your matrix, matrices get larger and larger. So the point here is that you want to compensate on this fact. Once we do it in iterations, whenever we get to some iteration that we want to compute in a higher power, the rectangular dimensions get smaller and smaller. So we compensate on the fact that the entries are larger by the fact that the dimensions of the rectangular matrix get smaller and smaller, and we want to control each loop, each loop in this iteration so that it will never exceed something, say never exceed n to the omega or something uh, similar. So this is the point. We control, we, 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 we control the fact that the entries get larger by reducing the dimensions of rectang rectangular product. Okay, so this was partial distance matrices and now let's see how uh, we glue it all together. We already saw how to, how to take care of all, uh, of all pairs where C U V is large. It is at least C. And now we want to use partial distance matrices to handle all pairs where C U V is small. Uh, and remember, our ultimate goal is to really cut off the, the value of the entries inside this P because ent large entries are problematic. And remember, we want to solve threshold all pairs shortest path. I don't really want to compute to you exactly the distance. I just want to report all pairs whose distance is not, not above some uh, my threshold D. And we'll do it in two stages. We'll first uh, do an additive approximation of the distance. By additive, I mean I will uh, compute another value, delta star UV. It will be an actual path. Namely, delta star would be at least delta but it will not deviate from the shortest path by much. It will deviate by a small, say, theta of r, say 2r. Why is it good to have this additive approximation? It's good because if I, if I have delta star for every pair, then if I know that delta star is smaller than d, then delta also is smaller than d. Then I, don't, I know that surely I have to report this pair. And if delta star is larger than d plus 2r, then surely delta is larger than d. Then I surely know that I don't want to report this pair. The only pairs I don't know what to do is those pairs for which delta star is between and d plus, d plus 2r. But this is a bounded range, a range of 2r. So the second st stage will be to compute precisely delta for all the pairs in this set, in this undecided set. C, call this set C. This? Okay, I think I'll manage. Okay, so here is uh, how we do the additive approximation. Again, we won't be able to do it all at once. As before, I cut it into a logarithmic number of parts between t and t over 2, t over 2 and t over 4, etc. Let me explain how to do it between t and t over 2. Uh, so we remember, we computed our partial distance matrix, tr. Again, it is costly to do a product of P with itself and even costly to do a rectangular product of P with itself. So what's a naive way how to reduce the cost? Divide each entry in your matrix, divide it by a value of R. So if uh, your entry was 100 and R was 20, the entry becomes 5. Great. So entries are reduced. It's cheaper to do the multiplication. But what do we lose? You lose accuracy when you divide by a factor of R. You lose act additive accuracy of R in every one of the two matrices, so you only have an approximation up to 2R. 
but at least you were able to do it fast because you cut the values inside your matrices. So this, is, this explains how we compute this delta star, and in particular, we have the set C. And now, our second goal is to compute precisely, del the precisely the delta for the pairs in this undecided set C. It's these pairs that I don't yet know what their distance is. So here, again, I'll not do it all at once. I'll do it between t over 2 and t over 4, t and t over 2, <coughs> t over 4, t over 8, etc. So let's see how to do it between when c u v is between t and t over 2. Uh, so call these subsets of c of these pairs, call it c0. So here is, um, again, I'm using the fact that in every interval I have a representative. So we know that we have a representative x, so that p u x plus p x b is this delta. But since we have many representatives, take the middle of this path. Not the middle with respect to number of edges, but middle with respect to delta. Delta uv over 2. Well, not necessarily you will have a vertex in, in the place d delta uv over 2, but at least since in every r interval there is an entry, you at least know that there is some witness whose value is between delta uv over 2 minus r and plus r. Here I assume that the weights are minus 1, 0, and 1. Otherwise, it will be mr and plus mr here. So I know that my witness hides inside these values. But I don't know delta. But I do know delta star. And I do know that delta star is between d and d over 2r. So I do know that, that delta is between d minus 2r and d plus 2r. So I do know that this witness hides between these values. And this is a bound in the interval, an in interval of size uh, theta r, 4r. So again, it will be very cheap to do the rectangular product. It will be a product in matrices whose entries are in an interval, a small interval, of size theta r. And this will be cheap. And now what you have to do is just optimize the values of t and r and everything, and then you get the right exponent in the algorithm. OK, so le let me conclude with a slide on open problems in this area. The ultimate challenge in this area is, of course, to improve upon chance algorithm. Remember, chance algorithm is just floyd Warshall divided by law square n, and cube divided by law square n. So the ultimate challenge will be to have something which is subcubic, truly subcubic. Even n to the point 99 would be a major break. Uh, likewise, uh, let's recall uh, Uri's algorithm for uh, all pairs. Even Uri's algorithm, by the way, also is also interesting where the graph is unweighted. Even if the graph is unweighted, then the running time, uh, the best running time then is known is, uh, in Uri's algorithm. His exponent, remember, was something like 2.58. And as I said, even if matrix multiplication is 2, his exponent would be 2.5. So if you can find an algorithm for all pairs shortest path in unweighted directed graphs, in this running time, this would be a breakthrough. Not a breakthrough like this, but a breakthrough one half smaller. <laughs> OK. Uh, likewise, uh, the uh, threshold algorithm that I just showed you, uh, remember this, uh, the exponent, even if matrix multiplication is 2, the exponent was 7 over 3. So even obtaining 2.33 would be nice, but it will be even nicer to show that uh, this diameter, for example, you can do it in matrix multiplication time, OK? For positive and negative edge weights. If the weights are only, for example, for unweighted graphs, diameter can easily be solved in n to the omega time. So this will not be interesting. And finally, Dijkstra's algorithm. We know that Dijkstra works on directed graph with positive integer weights. Even if you assume that the weights are integers, whenever you have negative edge, edge weights, you only can do a Goldberg's algorithm or the Euster Zwick algorithm, but we cannot rule out the fact that maybe single source in directed graph can be solved in maybe time which is faster than, say, the current matrix multiplication time. So this would also be very, very interesting. Um, I don't have more time. Good. <laughs> Thanks.